In a moment, I'm going to introduce you to a truly inspirational woman. But Sarah Sack is modest and probably wouldn't call herself inspirational. She almost certainly wouldn't want me describing her like that. She is honest, extremely frank and very good company. Her story is dark. She goes up against some extremely powerful forces, but she carries on fighting and emerges with justice. But the point of this podcast is, why did she have to fight for her amazing son? Fight against the powers that should have been supporting her. This is Behind the Crimes. You are a mother. You're abroad on holiday. After a few days relaxing in the sun, in the sea, in the pool, getting away from it all, you check your phone. What you see shocks you to your core. There was hundreds of missed calls, text messages. Anthony's dad had been trying to get hold of me. That was the stomach sinking feeling. I knew then something was really wrong. Your son, a young man just 23 years old, has been found dead in a London street. Police say nothing suspicious has happened. Was he shot? Was he stabbed? Was he beaten up? Young men don't just drop dead in the street. What is going on? So they said, no, there was not a mark on him. This was the heartbreaking plight in which Sarah Sack found herself. She knew her son. He didn't take drugs, not the kind that would take his life. And not like this. Something's killed him. It, you know, it, you don't just literally drop dead in the street. And they just kept saying, well, we don't know. They literally just were not interested at all. This is a journey which takes Sarah and her fight for justice up against Britain's biggest police force into the world's most famous courthouse and face to face with one of England's most notorious serial killers. A murderer who police met, interviewed, even charged with a minor offence, but still gave the freedom to continue his trail of devastation. They wouldn't listen to anybody. We were literally giving them clues and three lovely young men would still be here. My name's Robert Murphy. This is Behind the Crimes. Behind the Crimes is the podcast that tells you about the biggest or the most interesting cases from the people who were involved. Victims, detectives, experts, and sometimes even the criminals themselves. For more than 20 years, I've covered some of Britain's highest profile crime stories for television news. In this series, I'll be making a deep dive into each case to see how crimes were solved or how criminals managed to escape justice. If you want to see evidence from each inquiry, watch video clips, read more, or just get in touch, subscribe to the Behind the Crimes site. And please do rate and review our podcast. A word of warning, this is a true crime podcast. There will be bad language and descriptions some may find affecting. Listener discretion is advised. This episode is called The Dating App Killer. Anthony Walgate was born in Hull in May 1991. He had a brother, Paul, who was seven years older. His mum and dad had separated, and he lived with his mum and her new husband, Sammy. During the week, Sammy was away a lot, running a restaurant in Essex, so Anthony spent a lot of time just with his mum. They were close, and both comfortable when he came out as gay as a teenager. Can you just tell us a bit about him growing up? What kind of a, what kind of a son was he? He was so shy and, you know, timid when he was growing up. He, proper mammy's boy. He literally um, clung to my legs constantly, you know, and he, he wouldn't go out to play. He said, no, I'll, I'll stay at home with you, you know, and all this sort of thing. And um, he was like that. Never, ever got into trouble at school or anything. 
And it was like that until he sort of got to about 16, 17, um, went off to London and then just blossomed and sort of came into himself. And, you know, he had the most driest sense of humour and some of the things he came out with, it, it was just hysterical and he was just full of life, you know. And, and he had a name for you, didn't he? For some reason, when he got to about 14, he just started calling me Cesar. And, you know, and, and he never called me mum or mum or whatever. And, and he just always called me Cesar. And it just sort of stuck. And, and I actually got used to him calling me that as well. You know, he only ever sort of called me mum when he wanted something. <laughs> And he obviously grew up in, in um, Hull. Why the move to, to London? Because it was such a big thing for him to do, wasn't it? This was what his his dream, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, um, from being early teens. Because he, he I, you know, he sort of went out a bit in Hull and everything. And he said, um, he used to say, it's so boring here. You know, he wanted glitz and chubbies and life. And he said, you know, it's just not here. And... He wanted to be famous. Anthony was a third-year fashion student at Middlesex University. He lived in Golders Green in North London. He adored his London life, a life cut short in June 2014. I've been a journalist now for over 20 years and, and interviewing people who've been through something traumatic. One thing that always strikes me is how life can be like that. And then in a phone call or in a message, everything can change. Can you just tell us a bit about where you were and, and how things changed? I was in um, Turkey. I was on holiday um, with my husband. And um, it was the Sunday. We were due to come home on the Monday. And um, my husband was in the shower. And I'm sort of pottering about because we were having our last night out. And I just happened to get my phone out the safe and turn it on. That's how it came up. There was hundreds of missed calls, text messages, etc. And Anthony's dad had been trying to get hold of me. That's when I knew. That was the stomach sinking feeling. I knew then something was really wrong. So I rang my other son, who as soon as... I said, hello, he just burst into tears, you know, and then told me. What Sarah's eldest son, Paul, said was three words. The words that would change her life forever. The words, Ant is dead. In her book, A Life Stolen, Sarah describes how she threw the phone away in disbelief. Then after that, it was just bedlam, trying to get home. The uh, travel rep, to be honest, was amazing. She sort of took over and booked us flights that night. It's really strange how total strangers come to your aid. You know, they don't know you. Something's happened. And the actual manager of the hotel, he um, literally put us in his car and drove three hours to the airport. And he literally put his foot down and got us there, you know, skidded in and everything. Wouldn't take any money for payment, anything. And he got us there. The rep held said to the, you know, um, check-in that we were coming, you know, keep the check-in as late as possible and we sort of just run in, the runners through and everything. It was, they were fantastic. At that at that stage, the only details were, were what? That Anthony had been found dead. That was it. Anthony had been found dead in the street. That was it. Nothing else. That's all I knew. Um, and you, you returned to England, um, you went to your sisters, didn't you, where you found out a little bit more. What did what did you learn then? The, um, the police had turned up at my sister's and told her. And all again, all they'd said was that he was found dead in the street. And um, nobody knew why, what, or anything else. There wasn't a mark on him? There was, um, he was found by, did they mention anything about being found by a neighbour at this stage? No, no, nothing. All, all it was, was he literally was found dead in the street. At that point, when you've heard that, what's going through your mind? Because a, a healthy 23-year-old does not just die. Exactly, exactly. And um, when I actually rang the police later that morning and spoke to him and I said, you know, was he shot? Was he stabbed? Was he beaten up? Young men don't just drop dead in the street. 
what is going on? So they said, no, there's not, there was not a mark on him. I said, well, did his heart give way? You know, what? Because he was extremely thin. Um, I said, we don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. That was it. Can you give us an idea of what's going through your mind here? Because you must have so many questions. I, yeah, I did. I mean, I'd been we'd been awake over twenty four hours back then, and um, you know, obviously fatigue had set in and things. And I, I just kept saying to him, "Something's killed him." It, you know, it, you don't just literally drop dead in the street. And they just kept saying, "Well, we don't know. We don't know yet." And that was it. Anthony didn't live in that part of London. There was a reason for him to to be there. When did you discover? why he had gone there and, and what did you learn about why he had gone there? When I spoke to his two best friends, China and Kira, they were, um, I'd said, you know, what was he doing there? And they said that he'd gone to meet somebody. So when I spoke to the police, I'd said, who was he going to meet? Well, we don't know yet. And this is a thread that comes throughout this, isn't it? It's just the lack of curiosity. And that's what well, the coroner says in the end, isn't it? Yeah. They literally just were not interested at all. And um, I've, I've said since, if they'd have listened to us at all, the other three boys would still be here. You know, if they'd have actually done what they were supposed to have done. And that that is the most frustrating part of it, and, and which angers me more than anything else, is that they wouldn't listen to anybody. We were literally giving them clues, and three lovely young men would still be here. And already, you know, China's spider senses are going, aren't they? Because what she said, the message, the last thing Anthony said to her was he, he said he'd be careful and to call police if he didn't come back in case he was killed or something. Yeah, that was his weird sense of humour, you know. I mean, it, it was. He was quite weird like that. Um, but it came true. At the beginning, the police had done the right thing. They sent what's known as a homicide assessment team to the scene. The Met had a policy called Think Murder when coming across a sudden death. They should all be treated as suspicious unless it could be proved it was anything else. There's also an ABC of policing. Accept nothing, believe no one, challenge everything. A post-mortem said Anthony's cause of death was consistent with a drug's overdose, although further toxicology tests were needed. There were serious questions to be answered. Anthony had bruises under his arms, his underwear was back to front and inside out, and he was wearing a T-shirt which was far too large for him. And Anthony's friends told police he'd arranged to meet a man in Barking, someone he'd met on a dating app called Sleepy Boy, a man who called himself Joe Dean. Friends said Anthony and Joe had arranged to meet on the 17th of June. Anthony's phone was last used at 10 o'clock that night, but he wasn't found until four in the morning on the 19th. That's 30 hours later. Who was this Joe Dean character? Homicides are investigated by the Met's major investigation teams, but a superintendent on this team refused to take the case and passed it back to the local police. Sarah was given a family liaison officer who told her Anthony's death was not suspicious. I think his exact words as written in the book, were there's nothing to investigate. He took drugs and he died. There was a bottle of something next to him. Now, mums know their sons, don't they? Of course, 23-year-old sons are living 300 miles away, do have a different life. But what were your thoughts to that? Well, I actually said at the time, I said, Anthony was no no angel, but he had such a wariness, you know, a spidey sense about him because he was mugged six weeks after he got to London and um, he was so careful. I said to him, if you don't believe what I'm saying, speak to his friends. He would get so drunk he fell asleep, you know, but only with his friends, only when he knew he was safe. I said he would not ever put himself in danger with somebody he didn't know. How were the emergency services called? Who called them? And what do you think about Again, the lack of curiosity about the character who called the emergency services. Well, it was actually Port that called the, you know, rang in the 999. When Sarah says Port, she's talking about Stephen Port. He was a 39-year-old chef who lived in Barking. His apartment was next to where Anthony's body was found. And Anthony's friends show police the image of Joe Dean, the hookup man, on the Sleepy Boy app. It was Stephen Port. 
report was on the police national computer. Less than two weeks before Anthony died, officers had been called to Barking Station to a report of a man being assaulted. They found Stephen Port there with a man who appeared to be drugged. He made an excuse, was believed. No action was taken, but the details were logged. Port was gay. He was tall, well-built, a regular gym-goer. He was also bald and sometimes wore a wig. When Anthony was found and Port was approached by police, they didn't go into his flat. They looked at neither his phone nor computer. Had they, what they would have found would have been horrific. Despite the information on the police national computer, they seemed to accept his story that he'd found Anthony's body outside his flat, called 999, and gone to bed. I'd said straight away, well, if you found a body, whoever you are, you wouldn't go home and go to bed and just, you know, leave that person. I said, out of just anything, you would just wait until the ambulance turned up and the police turned up and things like that. So why would he go and go to bed? Just, you know... Leave the person. Emergency ambulance. What's the address of the emergency? This is that 999 call. Cook, Cook Street. There's a young boy. Looks like he's trapped outside. I don't know. Outside of which number? Uh, 4758. Sorry? 4758, I think. Stephen Port doesn't give his name and he's evasive. When the operator asks for his phone number, he starts talking about needing to get his car. When the operator asks for confirmation of his location, Port seems to forget. I don't know, I just, I didn't look. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, well, we've arranged some help. We'll get someone there as soon as possible. If you do get any further information about his condition, please call back immediately on 999. Of course. Of course, he doesn't. You wouldn't just ring an ambulance and then go to bed and, le- and leave that person there. But they just had no curiosity of, of anything. And that goes to looking at Anthony's laptop as well. They said um, they called analysing his laptop a wild goose chase. Yes. And too expensive. Why would we do that? It's too expensive. Anthony had died from an overdose, police were assuming. They said a small bottle of drugs was found next to him. Sarah told them that while Anthony smoked cannabis, he would only do so with friends, never strangers. And Sarah had more questions. Anthony's phone had vanished. He was never without his phone. And Anthony's family started receiving strange phone messages. His dad started getting some really nasty texts. And I said said to the police, you know... Trace it, find out who's doing this. Surely they must have something to do with with this, the things that they were saying. But police embarking did not follow this up. They did look at Stephen Port, but not in the way Anthony's mother wanted. They did arrest Port, but not for an assault, not for uh, murder or manslaughter, but for perverting the course of justice because he changed his story three times. Just tell us the three different stories, the three different accounts that they gave to police. Uh, The first one was that he'd come home from work and found him. That was the original one. Then the second one was that he didn't, he knew somebody called Anthony, but it it wasn't Anthony. It was a different Anthony. And then the third one was that, yeah, it was Anthony. He took all the drugs himself and came extremely ill. So he put him into his bed, went off to work for an eight-hour shift, came back and found Anthony dead, and so he panicked. My immediate thing was, why would you invite a total stranger into your house, put him into your bed, and go out to work for eight hours? I said, he could have robbed you blind or done whatever. I said, why would you do it? Think about it logically. Take a step back. You would never leave a total stranger in your house and go to work. So, and, the, and, and it was constant just shrugging. Well, that's what happened. So you know from 250 miles north or however far Hull is from Barking that, that there is something just critically wrong with this investigation. C- can you... And these are dark days for you. I mean, so dark that you can't even get help from victim support. I know, I know. That, that was appalling that day. It really was. Um, I was just, it, 
I don't know, this day it just sort of everything came crashing down and everything. And my sister took me, she went like, right, get in the car. Went to, well, we went to Samaritan's first and we walked and it, it, it if I hadn't been in such a state, it'd have been laughable because I walked in this young girl of, oh, 18. Now, what can I help you with sort of thing? And I just looked at her and I thought, oh, God, you are, you know, you are, you're a baby. How, how, how can you have any grasp of life, you know? So she said, oh, go to victim support. So we went off to victim support and my sister explained to this woman and she just went, she just turned around blankly, looked at me and she went, well, you're not actually a victim, are you? And that was it. And I thought, and my sister's like, what do I do? What would, you know, what can I do with her to help her? And late after that, I'd said, you know, when we months later we were talking, I said to my sister, even if she'd have just sat and given me a cup of tea and listened to me for 10 minutes, you know, that would have made all the difference. So they, they sent us off to Mind. So we went to Mind um, and they made me an appointment and I went in and sat there with this guy and this guy's talking away and I'm just sat there and it's sort of I'm like Ooh, and it's all listening to me and, he, and he's saying you know I know you feel I lost my best friend blah 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 and I just looked at him and I went you don't it's nothing like losing a husband a wife a best friend a cousin a sister brother it's not the same and I went this in for me and I just got up and walked out Back down in London, Anthony's friends were asking questions. These were young people with no scientific knowledge, but they suspected he had been date-raped. They asked police if there was any sign that Anthony had been given a drug called GHB. GHB stands for gamma-hydroxybutyric acid. Its street name is G. It's a clear, odourless liquid. It's illegal too, a Class B drug in Britain. It can give a feeling of euphoria or relaxation. It's used commonly by gay men in so-called chemsex parties. It's also used as a party drug by straight people. And it's been called a date rapist's weapon of choice. In the early weeks after finding Anthony, police wouldn't have known he had GHB in his system. This was June 2014. The toxicology reports confirming a GHB overdose wouldn't come back until the September. But the signs were there. Sarah Sachs says experienced detectives would have been asking the question. Had you ever heard of that at that point? And what I, did you I heard of it. Um, I didn't really, you know, know the ins and outs of it. But China had actually asked that in the beginning. You know, was it GHB? Because obviously, the younger and they know all the, you know, things about it, etc. And then when I found out, because originally I found out, obviously, the first inquest was there was no substances like heroin, cocaine, that sort of thing. Um, so when I found out it was GHB and I turned around and I said, Some, not right here again, I told them. But they just wouldn't listen. While Port was free on bail, awaiting trial for perverting the course of justice, two other young men were found dead. Both were discovered in the graveyard of a church near Barking Abbey, just five minutes' walk from Stephen Port's flat. The first was Gabriel Kavari. He was 22 and originally from Slovakia. Had police investigated properly at the time, they would have discovered Gabriel had met Port on a website called Fit Lads on August the 18th, two months after Anthony died. Gabriel had even moved in with Port for five days on the 23rd of August, and five days later, Gabriel was found dead. Again, there was a to and fro between local police and the major investigation team about who should run the inquiry into Gabriel's death, and it stayed with the local police. And three weeks later, Daniel Whitworth, the youngest victim, just 21, was discovered in the same place as Gabriel. With Daniel's body was an apparent suicide note saying he'd killed Gabriel. In truth, the two men had never even met. What is going round your mind when you hear where they are and what's happened? Well, I uh, 
constantly was looking at the back, backing and Dagenham post to see, you know, if there was anything on it. And it came up about this. The reporter had asked the police if they were these were linked. So when I rang him and I said to him, you know, they're just literally on top of each other sort of thing. And he said, they're not linked. He said, one wasn't from the area and one was homeless. And that was it. End of story again. When you look on a map, you know, in your mind, is it linked? And, and is it a person at this point doing this, actively attacking men? Yeah, well, I said to him, you know, look at the map. The details of this case is that, that Daniel, who died nearly a month after uh, Gabriel, um, had a suicide note saying that he'd killed Kavari. And this note... Um, tell us a bit about this note and what the police did with this note and who they showed it to and how little of it they showed. Yeah, well, um, his partner, Rick, um, wasn't even acknowledged as his partner. He couldn't, wasn't allowed to be shown the note. Um, but apparently the police woman had literally just put it in a bag, into a handbag. You know, it wasn't classed as evidence sort of thing. Daniel's parents were shown bits of it and they were saying, well, we're not sure if that's his handwriting because, to be honest, young lads don't write anymore. It's all texting. And they said, you know, we'll look at old birthday cards, that sort of thing, but we're not sure that it is his handwriting. And they were quite, I mean, I've become very good friends with them both and they were quite, they're quite quiet, introvert people. <laughs> And so, you know, they were challenge, as challenging as me um, and they spoke afterwards to them and they said, you know, we wish we'd have done more, but, you know, the police, they were quite overpowering to us. They were saying, no, this is this, this is that. In fact, Daniel's family were never shown the letter directly. A fragment was emailed to them. They just weren't sure if it was his writing or not. And spare a moment to think of Daniel's friends and family. Not only had they just been told he had died... But they were also being told police assumed the note was true. With that being the case, he was effectively a killer. Where was the ABC of policing? Accept nothing. Believe no one. Challenge everything. I think you were told coincidences don't make a crime. Yeah. 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 Um, that's, what, what, that's what I'd said to him. You know, why are you not thinking, you know, this? Th- you've got... These three young lads in this area, you know, in suspicious state, just dumped everything. Don't you think it's a bit coincidental? You know, well, I don't make a crime. So it, it was to the point of you wanted to scream and say to them, you know, do your bloody job for God's sake. Just, you know, we can. everybody can see this. I can see it. China can see it. Kira can see it. We're all watching it. We're all looking at this picture come in and nobody else seems to be if these three young men had been women do you think i've I've always said that i've always said that i've said it many many times and more as well i think if it had been three women there'd have been a lot more press interest as well a hell of a lot more press interest how much do you think there was some unintentional homophobia or maybe even intentional homophobia here there was i think it was there from the very beginning in the inquest um and i will talk about a particular officer because he's the one that i've got a problem with um the actually came up with a um i don't know whether you've read bits of the inquest but they, they came up with an email he'd sent from his private email to his work one and it had said on it that um the lads all went to sex orgies, et cetera, et cetera. So the, our barrister actually said, right, how many sex orgies has Anthony been to? So he said, oh, well, uh, none, but that's what I thought they all did, you know, sort of thing. And we were, we were sat there, it was like, I can't believe you just said that, you know. Um, that's what all young gay lads do. Ports admitted perverting the course of justice. Four months in four months sentence and then four on license, but actually only served two months and he was tagged. You couldn't attend, could you? Because it's a very last minute thing. W- would you have liked yeah. to have gone to, to that? Oh, definitely. I mean, it, they, the police finally came to see me in the following March 
Um, so it was 10 months before I even saw my liaison officer. Um, they came on the Friday and he was actually at court on the Monday. Mm. Sammy, your ex-husband, uh, uh, saw him and described him as uh, looking like a predator. Yes. Uh, and what are your thoughts here when you've got all these descriptions, you've got all this background, but yet not only are you going through your grief, you're having to fight against the, the organisation that should be investigating and supporting you. Yeah. Um, it was, at times, it was very overwhelming. It really was, you know, having to work full time, investigate this, um, grieving for Anthony. It, it was quite overwhelming. And it shouldn't have been. It sh- they should have been doing the jobs to start with. As police continued not linking the deaths of three young men, Stephen Port was released from prison, free to claim his fourth and final victim. Jack Taylor was 25 years old. His body was found on the other side of the church wall to Gabriel and Daniels. Jack's sister said he would never have taken drugs. He was always being tested for substance misuse with his job as a forklift driver. So how could he have died from an overdose? It would later be discovered that Jack had connected with Port on the dating app Grinder. Jack's sisters complained to police, embarking that detectives just weren't investigating his death properly. CCTV footage was found of Jack on the night he died, meeting a man at Barking Station. When one officer was looking at this footage, by coincidence, another officer from Anthony's inquiry happened to pass by and recognised the other man as Stephen Port. As soon as I'd seen that, um, I rang Sammy and I said to Sammy, is that the man? So he said, it really, really looks like it because it wasn't that clear. He said he really does look like him. So I rang China. China looked at it and she went, that's him. That's that's him. So, you know, them two, were, but Sammy was 90%, but China had said, yeah, that's him. It was then that the inquiry pivoted. Finally, the serious crime squad agreed to take the case away from local officers. What are you thinking now? That um, that things seem to be changing. It wasn't until I met the Serious Crime Squad and Ian Atkinson, and I must say, he's I've never met anybody more born to do a job. He was my new liaison office. Oh God, he was he, and he still is. He still messages me. He was amazing, and I did give him a bit of hard time when he first came. He, he came and he sort of sat there, and I went. So you're going to be any better than the last lot sort of thing. So, you know, we're going to do this and that lot. And I was a bit rude to him. And um, Tim turned around and said, look, stop. Wipe the slate clean. Trust me, when I finished, I will even know who we sat next to at nursery. We're totally different from them, you know, and and the, the way. They were what I would expect the Metropolitan Police to be. They were totally professional and they were fantastic. But this new major crime squad inquiry was hampered by earlier mistakes. They had to win over the families who frankly doubted this new team's abilities or intentions. Gabriel had been dismissed as just another homeless overdose by police. His death had hardly been investigated in the days after he was found. Officers hadn't kept the blanket in which he was discovered. Had they, they may have found Port's DNA on it. Both Gabriel and Daniel's deaths had been written up as non-suspicious. The suicide note was simply just believed. And Jack Taylor. As if primal grief wasn't bad enough for Jack's family, they would have a further ordeal when his body was exhumed for further tests. What was clear was that each of these four men had arranged to meet Stephen Port through one of several dating apps. Port had drugged each of them with GHB. And when the news broke of the homicide inquiry into these four men's deaths, more men came forward saying they'd been drugged by Port too, but had survived. A double inquiry started the Metropolitan Police investigating Stephen Port and the police watchdog investigating the Met Police. What was that moment like, hearing that this was being taken seriously, not just taken seriously, you know, everything you've known but have been fighting against was suddenly 
different. It was sad, really. To be quite honest, it was sad that I'd had to go through that all that time. It wasn't a case of, well, I told you so. I thought it was quite sad that um, there were so many other victims, all these young men, none of them felt they could come forward before the appeal. Um, and if any of them had to come forward, you know, that again might have stopped the process of the four lads. Because it, 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 he literally was playing Russian roulette because he was just drugging them all. And, you know, depending on how much or their body weight or anything was whether they could take that. And unfortunately, Anthony, the other three lads who were all slight and thin couldn't. You know, it killed them, all the others, for the grace of God. They were fine. They just woke up the next you know, a few hours later. Were you involved in administering any drugs or poisons or noxious substances to him? No, I don't administer drugs to anyone or give drugs to anyone. Port was arrested and questioned. This is an interview from the 15th of October 2015. Port sits in a police room. He is confident, he is softly spoken, and he is in denial that he has done anything wrong. No, he says, he did not spike the men's drinks with the date rape drug GHB. So obviously Anthony was found slumped outside your address with uh, a large amount of GHB in his system. The other three men we've been discussing were all found over by the wall area of the abbey. You can see on the map, all of them were slumped against the wall with a large amount of GHB in their body. Can you account for that at all? No, I can't. I mean, Stephen, did you, did you write this letter here, CRT 11? No, I didn't. Photos of it, it's found with Daniel. Who turned us the truth, Stephen? I am telling you the truth, yes. About the letter? Yes. He didn't write the suicide note, he says at the end. Between 2015 and 2016, Port was charged with four counts of murder and four counts of manslaughter as alternative charges for the deaths. There were other charges of administering a poison, rape and sexual assault. As well as the men he had killed, there were seven others who survived a drugged attack by Stephen Port and more details were emerging about this predator. A former friend later said he had an unhealthy obsession with young men. He had a strange fixation with children's toys. And in his flat, around the Transformer models, he had drugs paraphernalia. He was a chef, and had even appeared in the background of an episode of Celebrity Masterchef. That was in 2014, the same year he killed his first three victims. But soon he would be back on TV as his trial was played out on the evening news. Port originally indicated he would plead guilty, but then he decided and to change that. What impact does that have on, on you? The trial was horrendous and it was, there was so much evidence. I don't even know how he think he thought he could plead not guilty. You know, it, it, it the serious crime squad were absolutely so thorough in what they did. And it was quite, well, I suppose it was chanting his arm. Stephen Port's trial began in the autumn of 2016. This trial's going in London. You you live in Hull, I guess, until now. You've probably not had much to do with the criminal justice system. No. Certainly <laughs> nothing uh, involving courts and certainly nothing... Like it was the old Bailey as well. So just what was that like coming down to this, the most probably the most famous courthouse on the planet? It was to be honest, it was terrifying. I mean, we came around the corner, obviously, and there's tons of press there. You know, the filming us, they were shouting at us. It it really was stressful. It really was frightening at, at points. You know, it was you're going into the old Bailey, obviously I've never been there, and it, it, it is a big sort of intimidating time it, it was awful what was it like walking into court and seeing port for the first time 
it was hard not to scream at him, to be quite honest, you know. he um, I, I'd actually said to Ian Atkinson, my liaison officer at the time, I said, it's like he's sat on a park bench watching, you know, the world go, but as if as if it was nothing. And, and I said, you know, is he a bit backward? Because it, it literally seemed like he was sat on a park bench watching the world, you know, and really sort of this and enjoying it. And it was awful. What did he look like? Describe him to us. Ugly and old. Because obviously he didn't have his wig on or anything. And he looked quite as if, it, you know, you wouldn't want to meet him on a dark night. He was, he wasn't intimidating, but he was ugly. That's all I can say. He was he was ugly, and he was quite obviously a large man as well, um, you know, well built. And I just thought, you know, why would all these young lads want to be with you? What was it like looking at him and thinking this man is responsible for the death not just of my son? But three other men, and and God knows, yeah, you know, and and other attacks too, with with men who who were lucky enough to survive. That this one person is responsible for so much uh, trauma, so much hurt, so much pain. I tried not to look at him so much. I, I sort of more focused on the jury more than anything, um, because he was just making me angrier and angrier and you know and. and, and and it was taking my focus off what was the rest of the place, what was being done. And sort of um, I spent a lot of time watching the jury, their their expressions and, you know, how they sort of listen to things um, because it, it totally and utterly took me away from what was happening and I wanted to hear the evidence and, you know, see the jury's reaction of it. Because on top of... The murders, um, he was charged with, with sex attacks as well, wasn't he, with rapes? And there was uh, police found, and this is dark, isn't it, uh, 83 videos of him attacking yeah. men. Yeah. You know, just found yeah. it on, on his phone, wasn't it, or his computer? Um, both, a bit of both, yeah. The trial lasted for weeks. Many of the police's basic mistakes were highlighted throughout including a harrowing experience for the woman for whom walking through that barking churchyard was part of her daily routine. A woman who discovered both Gabriel Cavari and Daniel Whitworth. There are a couple of other details here which I can't quite believe. That firstly, it's the same person who found two of the other victims. We actually spoke to her after she'd given evidence and um, she lived on her own, bless her. Um, she was out walking a dog and she, and she said to us, you know, I still have nightmares about it and I can't believe that twice it happened, bless her. Yeah, I think that really did affect her as well. The police hadn't kept uh, Gabriel's blanket because they described it as being an overdose. But when they did keep Daniel's sheet, there was Port's DNA on it. Uh, yeah, it it really was just it, it pre, you know, conceived ideas that he was homeless, druggy sort of thing, and and poor Gabriel, he, he wasn't even investigated, and you know, nothing was done. They didn't bother keeping it. They just assumed it was a drug overdose and things like that, and. And one thing I, I did find when in the inquest I thought was absolutely appalling was that the female police officer that was supposed to be his liaison. Now, bear in mind, his family are abroad. They got the phone call to say he'd been found dead. Then not she, she forgot to get in touch with the family. They had nobody at all to speak to or anything until parts were cha charged with the murder so you know nothing no communication no nothing because she forgot and the note that we've just talked about earlier more was found out about that tell us what was eventually found out where that note came from uh, but, uh, well it came from parts and, and as well as the barrister had said where was the pen 
you know, he'd supposedly sat and wrote this note saying that he'd lost his phone. So obviously he wrote it while he was sat there. So where was the pen that he wrote it with? And, you know, the handwriting, there was no expert things done to it or anything. It was just, it might be, it might not be his handwriting, that sort of thing. It, everything about it was lazy. Simple as that. It was lazy. As the nine weeks carried on, how did you feel about your chances of success in the trial? As it went on, it was better and better because the defence didn't seem to have any defence. The defence didn't really do much because there wasn't really much of a defence. After more than two months of hearing evidence, the jury retired for their deliberations. They returned with verdicts, but not on all counts. What was it like when the first verdicts came back? So they, the first three verdicts, when the foreman comes back and they stand up and the clerk in the court says, have you reached a verdict in which you've all agreed? And they say, yes, we have. Just, just describe that moment to me, please. Well, well, to be honest, it was a bit confusing because... Um, Ian Atkinson was sat about three away from me and they were saying on count one, guilty or not guilty, so they said like guilty, count two. And I'm thinking, what the f*** is count one? What's count two? And I'm looking at Ian like that and he's scribbling it down like this and he's, he's okay, I'll, I'll tell you. But you got that he'd been convicted at least of at least one murder at that point, did you? Yes. Yes, yes because um, obviously um, Jack's family was like, yeah, sort of thing. So I thought, that must be that, because obviously you're having to be quiet in court, and I'm, that was quite stressful then few minutes because I didn't know what count one, two, and I didn't got that info. Did you, did you check Port how he was reacting to this? Yes, I looked at him. Absolutely nothing. He just sat there again. I, I just found that cops it was just no expression whatsoever. He just sat there blank, you know, as if. As again, as if he was sat in a park. The jury had convicted Port of the three other murders and of Anthony's manslaughter, but they couldn't decide on Anthony's murder charge. Sarah faced an agonising wait, but the judge allowed the jury to make a majority verdict where ten of the twelve could agree. That did it, and Sarah Sack finally got the murder conviction for which she had waited more than two years. What was it like then to, to finally get justice, to get that murder conviction, to, to, to know that your feelings were correct for, for, for Anthony as well? You, you can't get him back, but there's some justice for him. It was fantastic. I took China and Kira to our restaurant that night in Essex <laughs> and we drank all night, to be quite honest, in about half a spa in the morning, we got so drunk. And um, it was, it was fantastic. It really was a good feeling. Stephen Port was sentenced to life in prison. He was given what's called a whole life order. This means he will never be eligible for parole. He is a killer so dangerous he joins a group of only a few dozen prisoners who are classed in this category in Britain. After the trial there was the inquest which happened November December 21 wasn't it um what was that like going through that and hearing what you already knew was the litany of failures by the metropolitan that was worse than the trial I thought that was much worse than the trial in what ways because at the trial it was um more about his what he, he he had physically done. At, at the inquest, each police officer had to explain why they didn't do this, why they didn't do that, what had happened. And, and I just thought it, that was awful. It really was awful. And what was it like hearing p- police force hadn't linked 
the deaths or investigated further or looked at Anthony's computer or kept the blanket or, or gone into Stephen Port's flat? Well, what we've done as, as families where because of COVID, etc., and they put everything was up on screens. So what we'd done is we'd worked out when um, he was being interviewed, if you sat on a particular seat, he could see you um, on his screen. So we kept swapping seats onto this one, whichever police officer we wanted. So I sat when he was being thinking, so all he could see was my face and I just sat and stared and I just kept shaking my head like this. And he called us all liars. And <laughs> yeah, that said, so um, Mrs. Sack, um, so-and-so's lying, um, so-and-so's lying. Yeah. So I said, everybody's lying but you. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was, I think the inquest was worse than the trial. The findings of the coroner were pretty scathing. One of the most widespread institutional failings in modern history. Um, if police had properly investigated Anthony's death, the three other murders would have been prevented. Until then, I always had this feeling of, could I have done anything else? Could could I have done anything? I did, you know, I went to the MPs, I went, to, I did this, I did this. And then when we got to the inquest, it sort of gave me a bit of ease because I'd said to them, don't matter what I did, even if I knocked on 10 Downing Street, these coppers couldn't have cared less. They did not do the job. So it gave me a bit of relief a bit that, you know, it wasn't the fact that I didn't do enough to make them listen. Whatever I did, they wouldn't have done. They'd have still done exactly what they did at the point where, oh, well, I forgot to do that. I didn't have time to do that. Well, I didn't think, you know, I passed that over to so-and-so. So that, for me, was a, a good a bit of a release of, of thinking, you know, I couldn't have done any more because they'd have still acted how they acted. Do you think the police or the Met Police has done enough to change? No, not at all. Not at all. And after the inquest, you have written this book, which is phenomenal. It is a phenomenal read. It's just exquisitely written and both you... Um, and Anthony come across as very big characters. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> what's the process been like of writing writing the book and what's it meant to you? Well, it started off really as a sort of uh, a diary to start with because obviously I was speaking to so many people and so, and so I'm having to write down and spoke to so-and-so about so-and-so and, -so and this sort of thing, you know, and, and it carried on like that. And... It was very, very tough at times, but it was also very therapeutic. And um, I wrote it, and then I'd said to Jackie, can you make it pretty now? <laughs> because there was quite a lot of swearing in it. And, <laughs> Jackie's and, your co-writer, isn't she? Yeah. And she literally wrote what I wanted to say, but not as long and drawn out as I would say it, or she took the swear words out and things like that. And uh, to be honest, we work really well together. She and you have, and you have done a, a brilliant job. It is. I, I read it in, I think, two or three sessions. It, it, it just It's just so easy to read. And it's not just the book as well. You've had the drama as well. Tell us about that, Four Lives. Oh, yeah. And was... you were played by Sheridan Smith. Yeah, yeah. Um, when the BBC approached us and um, we were sort of like, oh, God, you know, this sort of thing. Um, and then Neil McKay, I got to know him a lot more. And I would said to him this one, jokingly, this one day, I said, yeah, but obviously I'm from up north. I said, you need some gobby northern bear to play me. You can't have somebody that's posh. I said, you need somebody like Sheridan Smith laughing. Then a couple of weeks later, he'd said to me, do not tell anybody but she's agreed to play yet yeah. and I'm like oh, oh my god you know like this sort of thing um and then obviously I met her a couple of times and that lot and I and I think to be honest she did an amazing job you know we spent about two hours sat chatting and and she was asking me questions sort of thing and she's saying you know when you got to this point how was it so I was like sort of thing and she said and she's going was it like ooh? And she, you know, she was very good at 
getting the emotions of that particular time. Looking back now, and it is eight years, isn't it? Um, what are your thoughts now uh, about about Port? Everybody said to me, you know, about, you know, the death sentence and all that. And I went, no. I said, I wouldn't want it. I said, can you imagine waking up in your 40s every day and knowing you're never, ever going to get out of prison? I said, that to me is an absolute, one of the best, you know, punishments I could ever think. He can live to be 90. Every single day is going to be exactly the same and he's never, ever getting out. I said, so that to me is enough punishment. And one of the big themes of this podcast series is about learnings, what learnings could be taken. But I think this whole case is about <laughs> learnings. Are there any yeah. learnings that we haven't talked about that you think police forces should be doing or people should be doing or young men? One is, um, obviously, if you're going to use a dating site like Grand or anything else like that, be safe. Do not go to – that. that's a big one for me. Do not go to somebody's house. Meet them in a pub. You know, meet them like in the old-fashioned days that we used to. You know, you go into a pub, you'd meet somebody. You have that chance to get that first impression. You know, you can spend 10, 15 minutes and thinking, oh, no, he's a bit of, you know, he's a bit of weird, this one, you know. Don't take it. That, that, to me, is a massive thing, especially with young gay lads. Don't just think everybody's, you know, lovely and things like that. I mean, I did. Somebody, oh, about two years ago, somebody messaged me on Facebook, a lady in Hull. Her lad was 14. He's gay. He'd sneaked out on the night and went and met a man. She was beside herself. She didn't know what to do. She said, um, I don't know what to do and everything. So I said, you know, do you live local? So she said, yeah. I said, I'll come down and see him. Took my book. So I went, I, do you know what? I still, he, he is the loveliest young lad. He is so lovely. I went down and I said to his mum, off you pop, you know, well, I just give him the right act. I said to him, um, you know, did you go, how did you meet him? Oh, I met him on ground, blah, 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 and all this lot. So I said, oh, I said, I'm like, was he nice? Oh, yeah, he was real nice. I said, oh. I said, do you know when you went in, did, you know, did you have out to eat or drink? He said, oh, yeah, I got a bit a drink of water. I said, oh, what did he put in it? He said, what do you mean? I said, that's what my Anthony did. Anthony had a glass of wine. I said, within 10 minutes, he was dead. And he was like, oh, and I went, that's how easy, and I scared the shit out of him, to be quite honest, and I did. And that is my whole intention I wanted to do. And she come, come back in and she was crying and she was like that. She went, I just don't know how to, you know, get through to him. And I said to him, go read my book. Go read my book. I said, because if you carry on doing this in five years' time, that'll be your mum. And I still keep in touch with her now and he's never done it since. <laughs> And he is so lovely. And he's such a lovely lad as well. So that made a difference just to one person who thought, you know what, I'm 14, I'm indestructible, I'll go make that. And it was just, he was only in his 20s. I said, but you don't know who he is. And that made that one difference. The inquest into Stephen Port's victims found that fundamental police failings probably contributed to the deaths of Gabriel, Daniel and Jack. The jury found the leadership and supervision locally was inadequate. The cases should have been elevated to the major crime squad. Officers made basic errors. There had already been an investigation by the police watchdog which looked at 17 officers. All but one of them gave no comment interviews but gave written responses. None was found to have a case to answer for misconduct, although nine were told they needed what's known as management action. In June 2022, the IOPC said it would reinvestigate the Metropolitan Police's handling of the case. That remains ongoing as this episode is broadcast. In a statement, Commander John Savile of the Met Police told me, The death of these four young men is a tragedy and we are deeply sorry. There were failings in our police response. I give my own and the Met's heartfelt apologies. The whole of the Met is committed to improving our investigations, our relationships and the trust we have in us to keep them safe. Since the deaths of Anthony, Gabriel, Daniel and Jack, we've worked hard to ensure the service we provide is better while understanding we have more to do. Learning and recommendations from the Independent Office for Police Conduct, His Majesty's Coroner and our LGBT plus independent advisory group of community members have enabled us to make a range of improvements. 
His Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services have completed an inspection into how we respond and investigate death. We look forward to their findings and any recommendations they may have. We are offering every support to the IOPC during the reinvestigation of the initial police response into the deaths of Anthony, Gabriel, Daniel and Jack. If this reinvestigation makes further recommendations for improvements, we will of course consider those very seriously, in addition to any misconduct matters that may arise. Sarah Sack's book is called A Life Stolen. If you want to see video clips of Sarah, evidence from the case, or read the full coroner's report, subscribe to Behind the Crimes. Behind the Crimes is written, presented and produced by me, Robert Murphy.